it's just, it's searing. It's, it's aggressive. It's, it's fantastic. Read it. It's super short. Worth it. <laughs> Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Ketavon and today I want to talk to you about some of the books that I've recently been reading. I um, filmed one uh, monthly wrap-up video for June and to be honest I actually didn't really enjoy the the experience of filming because I felt um, this pressure to keep the time um, down because um, very few people want to watch a 45 minute plus YouTube video. Um, so I decided that maybe for July I would actually um, do sort of more frequent but shorter check-ins. Uh, and in the future, I don't know if this will be weekly or bi-weekly. We'll kind of see how it goes. It depends on what I'm reading and also how much I want to talk about what I'm reading too. Sometimes it's just like, I read it, I enjoyed it or whatever. Um, but other times I want to gush a little bit or, or maybe explain why I loved it. And, um, hopefully this sort of format works for that. I'm not sure if it will, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, so the first one I have here is Elena Ferrante's uh, The Story of a New Name. Um, this one is translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein, and it's the second in the Neapolitan novels. Um, I really, really love this one. I read the first one a month or two ago, and I picked it up originally for my Read Around the World Challenge. Um, this is the story of two friends, uh, Lila and uh, Lenu, two young girls growing up in Naples, Italy in the 50s. And it's marketed as, yes, the story of their friendship, but also the story of the country of Italy, which I was really intrigued by and thought was super appropriate for my Read Around the World Challenge. So I picked it up. Um, I found it a used copy and thought I'd give it a go. And I didn't love it, actually. I, I was like, okay, it's a nice story, um, but there, you know, nothing really grabbed me. Um, but then as I was reading the, the ending, each of these books in the series um, ends on a bit of a cliffhanger. <laughs> so I was like, oh, shoot, now I really want to know what happened. So I picked up the second book and immediately devoured the whole thing within a few days. I loved it. It is definitely um, much more engaging. Uh, it's probably just because they're they're older. In the first book, they're, they're children. In the second book, it's like 16 to 21. So they're more, you know, it's more about their romantic relationships, their school and work career and things like that. Um, and it is very, <laughs> very engaging, or at least it engaged me. I really enjoyed the reading experience. And also as you're reading through the series, I think the, uh, the first book um, can be a little bit off-putting because there are so many characters besides just the two main characters. And it can get very confusing. There's all these different families and they each have their parents and the children and they're all um, referenced and, ex and it's expected that you know who they are. Um, there's even a cast of characters in the front to like help you keep track. And in the beginning, it doesn't really seem like they're important. I just sort of like, okay, there's, you know, the boys in the neighborhood and the girls in the neighborhood kind of thing. But then as the series, pro series progresses, those characters will obviously play bigger roles in different um, pieces of these girls' lives. So, um, it's all coming together. It's, it's, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to call this a series. Really, it's just one book broken down into four volumes. Uh, reading the first book on its own is, I think, a little pointless, to be honest, and you won't really get the story. So I'm on the second one, and after I finished the second one, it also ended on a bit of a cliffhanger. And I, of course, immediately ordered the next, the, the last two books in the, in the series because I was like, there's no way I'm not going to want to finish finish this. The first one I wasn't sure, but this one I'm at, I am. So really enjoying that one. Can't wait to continue. And then I have The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks um, by Rebecca Skloot. I don't know if you can see her name. It's in white. Um, this one is a nonfiction science writing and it's actually been on my shelf for quite a long time and it's originally I picked it up because I wanted to have more context. Um, I was a health educator for many years and I wanted to better understand the the black American um, hesitancy around healthcare and act and, and doing things like cer cervical cancer screenings and things like that uh, because of the historical uh, exploitation of their bodies. So this was sort of more picked up originally as background reading. And I honestly never picked it up um, because I thought I knew what it was about. <laughs> so essentially what I mean it is about um, this woman called Henrietta Lacks and she had very invasive, very aggressive cervical cancer and she was being treated for it at Johns Hopkins where they also did some medical research into cell, cu cell culturing, um, which is just the replication of cells um, sort of indefinitely. And they um, took her cells and 
at that point were unable to culture human cells. And for whatever reason, her cells were able to be cultured. And they have been used in medical research uh, for the past 70 years. They're still used today. Uh, these cells are singularly responsible for the capacity of our medical researchers to, uh, you know, come up with different cancer uh, treatments. Almost all medical testing is done with, uh, they're called HeLa cells for Henrietta Lacks, very, very anonymous, I know. <laughs> and um, so these HeLa cells have had a huge impact on our capacity to um, have medical advances. The, the, I would say the majority of medical advances in the last 50 years are probably due in some part to these HeLa cells. Uh, and of course, no surprise, they were taken without her consent and multiple, at least one or two corporations exist solely because they sell copies of these cells to researchers. And so some very, you know, wealthy people exist only today because of these cells that were taken from her without her consent. And so, you know, she unfortunately died relatively quickly from the aggressive cancer and left behind very young children. And so the book is actually sort of from the perspective of the author, uh, the author's process in writing this book because it was a very long journey. Um, the HeLa cells, you know, in the 60s and 70s when they were being used um, and, and, and all these like, you know, medical marvels were able to be happening because of them, uh, journalists were very aggressive with the family. They wanted um, to talk to them and the family very quickly realized like, oh, this is just further exploitation. So they were very, very hesitant to talk to, to the author of this book. And, but Skloot did an amazing job of building their trust, you know, asking what they wanted. And she actually had a very, very strong relationship with uh, Henrietta Lacks' youngest daughter, Deborah, who grew up without a mother because she was only a baby when her mother died. And she actually didn't really know much about it um, other than, you know, her mom had these cells and, and they changed the world. But nobody even explained to her really what they actually did. And so the the whole process was really more about... Um, Deborah and the rest of her family sort of reclaiming the story a bit, and um, it was a really beautiful read. It was very like heartwarming and tragic, of course, in in many parts, um, but it really uh, really hit home the idea of bodily autonomy, which of course is a very important subject lately in the news and and our current political climate. Um, but it wasn't just about the fact that the cells were taken without her consent. Uh, that part of the bodily autonomy is obvious, even though there's no possible avenue for compensation. Uh, but it, but Sklut does a great job of bringing up, you know, how our society has grappled with this idea of, of bodily consent and, and bodily autonomy, because, uh, historically, you know, I mean, first of all, black people were never given much you know, bodily autonomy, but even in general today, uh, there is actually still no regulation around what can be taken in terms of tissues. If, if some tissue has been removed from your body, it's not yours anymore. And so she, she does a really good job explaining the history of that and how that came to be. Uh, and she also explains sort of like the research side of it, which I found personally engaging as a researcher now. And that's actually why I'm almost glad I didn't pick this up earlier, because I think I wouldn't have appreciated that angle uh, as, as a non-researcher, uh, as much at least. And so she, she discusses uh, many different researchers, some of whom are, are great and, and realized, oh, I've been working with these cells my whole life and I actually never thought this is a, a real person, but now that I know I'm going to, you know, do something about it. And other researchers who, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a French researcher in here who, who had won the Nobel Prize for other work and then used that fame to sort of uh, trick the whole world into thinking he had uh, replicated chicken hearts, which everyone thought would be like, you know, we don't need to harvest organs anymore. We can just make organs and, and, and it'll solve all the problems. And of course, eventually that was, you know, found out to be false, but um, he spent a good chunk of his career lying about that. And, and other researchers who, you know, injected, um, you know, elderly patients who were very ill with with HeLa cells to see if cancer would grow. And when that got exposed because um, two young doctors refused to, to do it because it's obviously horrible and unethical, uh, the, the scandal that broke, the journalists asked him like, well, if it's so safe, why don't you do it to yourself? And he's like, well, you know, there's very few people 
that can that are but there's very few cancer researchers out there so to risk my life no matter how tiny the risk might be just isn't worth it but of course he felt it was totally worth it you know to to inject live cancer cells into patients in a hospital without their consent like they, they, I mean, they didn't even speak english like not even not even a modicum of consent was able to be given so anyway, the, the history of how the U.S. deals with bodily autonomy is very interesting. And also what I found super compelling was the story of Henrietta Lacks' oldest daughter, actually, who she um, was developmentally delayed and Henrietta took amazing care of her her whole life. They had a very strong bond. But then as Henrietta became sicker and was unable to care for her, someone, uh, I think a, a doctor, you know, encouraged her to send her to an institution where they could better care for her. And then, of course, after she died, uh, no one visited uh, Elsie, is the name of the oldest daughter. And uh, later, uh, Sklut and Deborah together, Deborah didn't even know Elsie existed. That's how um, tragic this story is. But then she later found out that they actually had done uh, very, very vicious experiments on her. Um, I forget what the what the procedure is called, but I believe it's called uh, pneumoencephalo pneumoencephalography, which was a very rudimentary version of the MRI. So prior to MRI, we only had x-ray and x-raying the brain does nothing because it's, um, um, the brain like floats in fluid and the fluid is what clouds the x-ray so you can't see anything. So what this procedure was, was they would drill holes into the skull, drain the fluid, take the picture, it would be super crisp because there's no fluid, and then for the two to three months that it would take for the body to replenish those fluids, you would be viciously ill. Um, headaches, seizures, um, just feeling horrible. And so they were trying to perfect this procedure, and they used people in living in institutions to do that because they, they could. And so um, they found out later through the research of this book that that Elsie had been subjected to those experiments and um, heartbreaking to, to know, but also an important story to tell um, because this this is one of the many reasons why institutions were dismantled in the 60s and 70s uh, because this kind of thing was rampant and um, and it was just like such a such an impactful read and it, it was so much more than I expected it to be, which is um, always a good thing in books. And um, anyway, so this woman is super important, Henrietta Lacks. Everyone should know her name. I highly recommend the book. Definitely pick it up. Um, so much, so much worth it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then next up, I have uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's Unaccustomed Earth. So this one is a collection of short stories and it's um, in two parts. Uh, the first part are just standalone stories, and I honestly was not a super big fan of this section. Um, each story on its own is pretty good, but they're all about affluent Indian immigrants in the United States, um, and all in higher education or academia. And it's so, so similar that I actually, like, in my head thought they were all in Boston because it all has that, like, Boston vibe. <laughs> and it's actually not all in Boston if, I, if you actually go and look at the each story one by one, but it feels like it's all in Boston. And it's just, they, they kind of all blur together. So while they were good, I would recommend spacing it a bit, like a few days in between each story, just to just to keep, keep it fresh. And then part two, I loved, it was amazing. It's a series of three short stories um, about the same group of people and it's told from different perspectives. Each story is told from a different perspective and those were fantastic. That, that made the collection for me, it was well worth it. Even though it's only like, I think about a third of the book, it's it's worth it. Um, even if you just read part two, worth it. <laughs> so recommend that one as well. Um, okay, and last but not least, we have Assembly by Natasha Brown. Uh, this is the story of a black British woman who has Jamaican descent. Uh, she comes from immigrant parents and she is has done all the things she's supposed to do. She, she got good grades, she went to university, she got a high paying job, she saved money, she brought, bought property. She's doing, she's checking all the boxes of what you're supposed to do in the capitalist cog system. Um, and, and we'll see why that that's not enough. <laughs> and so this is basically her stream of consciousness over the maybe day or two before she attends um, her white boyfriend's parents anniversary party. Um, this is sort of her debut into his world, which is very old blue blood uh, British family. And she knows right away that she's not going to be accepted. And despite being on paper, the perfect partner, she's literally 
got it all. Um, but they're, you know, it's clear that it's like, oh, you know, like, it's nice that you dated a black woman, you know, you're, you're woke, we raised you well, but it's not like you'll marry her, you know, like that's different <laughs> kind, of, kind of vibe. And so this stream of consciousness is essentially just all the microaggressions she experiences in this very short period of time. It's very aggressive. It's very stark, direct, blunt, um, harsh very harsh. But what makes this so powerful is actually, um, I find because she has ticked all those boxes, she is supposed to be the person that the, you know, the right wing, like conservative, um, elites will say like, see, why can't you just be like her? And her, her anger, her incredibly angry stream of consciousness just shows you that there is nothing you can do to escape the racism, um, of, of existing as a black person in um, British society or, or other predominantly white societies. And this, this anger is something we usually hear from extremely marginalized voices, someone who has, you know, multiple intersections uh, of marginalization, which I also enjoy those narratives as well. Like they're, they're, those are great as well. But this is just like this searing bluntness of like, F you, society's messed up. Um, is really uh, not unique, but it's 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 aggressiveness is usually not associated with that like fake plastic smile that um, care like people like our character main character are forced to to deal with and, and put on every day because you can only succeed in white society as a black person if you have that fake plastic veneer on and uh, when she takes it off it's oof it's <laughs> rough <laughs> so it's just it's searing it's it's aggressive it's it's fantastic. Read it. It's super short. Worth it. <laughs> Alrighty, so that was the last book I want to share with you today. I uh, really enjoyed filming this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you did, let me know. If you didn't, let me know as well. <laughs> um, but I'm kind of planning to sort of use these type of videos to replace the monthly wrap-ups just because, um, you know, the monthly wrap-ups are very overwhelming and I don't want to feel that pressure. Uh, and I want to also not be super rigid with these videos as well. I want it to be sort of more organic and less like, you know, every week or every other week and just sort of, I have a handful of books. I'm excited to talk about them. Let's talk about them uh, rather than being on any sort of set schedule. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but I hope you enjoyed and until next time. Bye.